Um, we were to have had uh, Stephen Webb on this session as well. You know that, uh, that Stephen passed away uh, a week ago today. Um, and I made some remarks about that, about Stephen uh, at the beginning. But what we do have, what I can share with you, are some notes that he sent to us. It's not a paper. I don't know that he'd written a paper. Um, he's anything or was anything like me. Uh, quite often the paper is still sort of steaming from the printer when I get up to get it. Um, but, um, but he did send us some notes of things that he was thinking about saying, some ideas that he had. And I thought I'd read those to you with, uh, with the proviso this was not a finished paper. These were notes. Um, sometimes it's a disservice to people. I remember a few years ago there was a, uh, a novel that was published by Ernest Hemingway um, called A Movable Feast. It was published many years after his death. And the reviews that it received were negative um, in many circles. And I thought, well, but it's not fair. He didn't publish it for a reason. It's not fair to publish someone's work when he decided himself not to publish it. Um, nevertheless, if you're interested in Hemingway studies, of course, it's interesting to see. But I, but I thought I wouldn't be doing a disservice to Steve if I were to read some of the thoughts that he sent to us, because they're quite interesting. So I'll try to do this justice. And then this will be brief, as I say, it's not a full paper, and then I'll introduce the two speakers for this session of the, of the conference. These are Steve's words. Every theologian from every church tradition wants to rethink the relationship between spirit and matter the supernatural and the natural, mind and body, and sacred and secular. Post-Enlightenment theology and philosophy have often treated these paired items as dualisms that stand opposed to each other. As a result, the world appears to people of faith to be off-kilter and out of balance, as if being religious means keeping one foot on the firm and reliable foundations of modern science and technology, and the other on the shaky and murky grounds of ancient beliefs and misty remnants of otherworldly wisdom, with the two realities rarely aligning to create a level playing field. Occupying two disparate spaces at the same time, especially when one is so clear and present that it makes the other appear to be remote and distant, is a difficult feat, which can make the religious life seem awkward and strenuous. Reconciling these dualisms requires focused intellectual labor in philosophy, science, and theology, but it also involves a journey of inward healing, that has consequences ranging from cosmology to social justice. Making progress on an intellectual problem like the nature of matter means little if it does not change the way we think, feel, and act regarding the most basic elements of our quotidian lives. Spirit and matter is first in my brief list of dualisms because rediscovering their proper ordering provides the key to unlocking the right relationship of all the other pairs. Being modern means being at home in the physical world in ways that pre-modern people never experienced. We are masters of matter, breaking open the smallest units of physical stuff to reveal secrets and unleash powers that the ancients hardly dared imagine. Matter to us is the name we give to opportunity, progress, and growth. Matter for the ancients smacked of limit, decay, and demise. That is why the divine was so often defined in terms of its immateriality. By immateriality, the ancients did not mean nothing but they did mean something like the opposite of material. God is not limited, does not change, and never dies. God is eternal, beyond time and space, because God is immaterial. Immaterial does not signify something substantial. I'm not sure if that was a mistake. Uh, whether he meant to say, it would be interesting to talk with him about it. Um, immaterial does not signify something insubstantial. Anyway, take that as you will. Um, instead, it suggests a negative. It is quite literally the opposite of material. It is the argument of my paper that defining God according to immateriality, which involves a complex edifice of various philosophical assumptions and arguments, does not do justice to the way we modern people interact with the material stuff of everyday existence. I would even go so far as to say that we are much more comfortable today in finding immateriality within the material rather than outside of it. Since we understand, as the ancients did not, that the stuff of the universe is not only saturated with forces and relationships that boggle the mind, but also that matter itself has little to do with standard qualities like hardness and resistance. In the atomic age, it is hard not to think of matter as the smallest conceivable bits of stuff, even when we know that there are massless particles, and that particles correspond in some weird way to antimatter, not to mention that particles disappear altogether in dark matter, whatever that is. And we know that there are more states of matter than solids, liquids, and gases. First there was plasma, then various forms of matter that do not exist naturally, like 
degenerate matter, super solids, super fluids, something called quark gluon plasma, and most re recently a new kind of liquid dubbed dropletons. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. The more scientists discover about matter, the less material it seems to be. If scientists can help us think about immateriality in new ways, then thinking about matter should help us to think about God in new ways too. These developments lend new meaning to the word materialism. Christians can feel threatened by those who think that only the physical is real, but they shouldn't be, since the physical covers a lot more reality than it used to. The hard sciences are becoming more metaphysical in their attempts to grasp the mysteries of matter, so why shouldn't theology become more material in its understanding of the divine? Scientists no longer know how to define matter, but they still believe that there must be a unifying theory that explains matter in all of its various manifestations and movements. That is, there must be something like an essence of matter, even if that essence is an awful lot like what philosophers and theologians used to call spirit. It is possible, of course, that the natural sciences will never discover this essence without relying on revelations about the supernatural, since matter has its origin, being, and end in God. The relationship between science and religion, then, has never been more open than it is today. What is taking place in philosophy and the sciences is also happening among everyday believers who are eager to discover a holistic spirituality that integrates all of physical reality into a theolo theological worldview. People are hungry to make sense of their material lives, and theologians are responding with new ways of thinking about embodiment. This theological development is happening across denominations and traditions. For example, Catholics after Vatican II talk of not just the sacraments, but a sacramental imagination that begins with the liturgy of the Mass, but far from stopping there, takes in an expansive and material approach to God's interactions with the world. Lutherans explore vocation as a way of embracing the embodied nature of our spiritual journey, and Presbyterian and other Reformed Christians continue to embrace the many ways in which grace extends to every area of human activity. Pentecostals have taught all Christians to be more open to the unpredictable and yet earthly and physical movements of the Holy Spirit. Evangelical Christians have brought the human body, with all of its emotional needs and concrete desires, right into the heart of worship. Megachurches appeal to every aspect of our personal, familial, and social lives, making room for every stage of life's journey within the church. Progressive and conservative Christians disagree about a lot, but they agree that bodies matter especially the bodies of those who are vulnerable, dependent, and weak. The physical form of life matters more to theology than it ever has. The church is entering into a new era, it seems, where the resurrected body of Jesus is becoming the norm, not just for our hopes and dreams about the afterlife, but also for our appreciation of everyday matters and ordinary objects. The destiny of the physical world should be inscribed in how we treat the environment and how we value all bodies, especially the most vulnerable and marginal among us. And there's a, uh, a set of ellipses here. I don't know what he had in mind there. And he continues, The subtle balance of power from the spiritual to the material has shifted so decidedly toward the latter that it is hard to imagine what needs to be moved to swing it back. When matter is mathematized, Christians are left appealing to the facts of revelation, whether those facts are located in the Bible or the church, scripture or liturgy. And when the facts don't seem clear enough, religion gets turned into an instrument of moral inspiration and social progress. Grace in the old scheme was a matter of the higher making room for the lower, then Christianity was a matter of the highest making room for the lowest. But now space, whether its expansion is infinite or cyclical, cyclical, appears void of depth, even amidst its multiplying dimensions. And thus our material world no longer gives us the coordinates for distinguishing a vertical ascent from a horizontal maze. Given the triumph of, triumph of math, we are forced to imagine that the relation of grace must be all one way or the other, since adding to one side subtracts from the other. We're surely not done with being platonic, but we just as surely cannot go back to Plato's enchanted cosmos, where in the Timaeus the stars were both gods and animals, a perfectly reasonable thought if one supposes that perfection, form, and life can be one and the same. We're stuck with matter as our principal metaphysical subject, and we need a new metaphysics to respond to new advances in science. Those advances do not add up to a coherent cosmology, at least not yet, but they do dig deeper into the muck of physical stuff than anyone ever thought possible. We look up less than our ancestors due to light pollution, but also the demystification of the heavens. Dark matter haunts us where the night skies once illuminated the darkness. But we can take our theological bearings from what scientists are finding beneath our feet.